Good morning. I uh, really did try to wear green this morning. I promise you, I do not want to be pinched. Uh, there's a shocking amount of Dodger blue in my wardrobe and not a lot of any other colors. Brought that up to my wife and she just said, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, she, she noticed that before today, but it's all right. I'm going to work on that maybe, maybe, we'll see. We're going to look at the Tower of Babel this morning. And uh, it's really interesting when you think about the Tower of Babel, what made them even think to build a tower? Like, where did that idea even come from? Hey, let's just build a tower to heaven. Well, Noah built an ark, so obviously they had the ability to build big things. And during this era, the Mesopotamia era, there was actually this brand new technology. For those of you who are technology geeks, you'll love this. They have this new construction technology called the brick. Okay, so I'm sure they're excited about testing out this new technology that they'd created. But the question is, why a tower? Well, one single architectural feature that dominated the landscape of early Mesopotamian cities was towers known as ziggurats, all right? And these ziggurats were, were a central feature in each of their cities. Now, in the early stages of civilization here, the city was not designed for the private sector. They didn't live in the cities, but in the city was where they had all their public buildings. So they would construct these ziggurats where they would have their granaries, their public buildings, their administrative buildings, uh, and these were connected to the temple complex where they'd come and bring their sacrifices and worship. Consequently, if you wanted to build a city, you started by building a great tower. So it's not a completely random idea for them to build a tower to the heavens. Now the question then is, what was wrong with this tower? I mean, obviously God does not have a problem with tall buildings. There are a lot of tall buildings in our world today. Currently, the tallest building in the world is the Berg in Dubai. It's 2,700 feet high. Nine football fields stacked end to end. 163 stories. That's huge. I haven't seen God coming down from heaven to knock that down. Okay, so you, you wonder what's the problem. It, it was also interesting when I was looking up the world's tallest building I was thinking about the Sears Tower because that was the tallest building when I first remember hearing about the tallest building in the world it was the tallest building in the world from 1974 to 1998 you realize that now it is the 21st tallest there's 20 buildings taller than the Sears Tower so I was only off by 20 and picking the tallest building in the world but anyway so what was wrong with the construction of the Tower of Babel. What caused God's anger to burn? What caused his wrath to pour out on this particular temple? What was so offensive to God? Let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, uh, and I'll begin reading in verse one. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So how did it all go wrong? Well, first, let's look at our plans, or let's look at humanity's plans. Notice the motivation for building the tower. Their motivation is, let us make a name for ourselves. And I think this is where they, uh, they started to go wrong, is they started out with the motivation to make a name for themselves. The plan was to build a tower to the heavens, literally to set themselves higher than every other people on the earth. It was to place themselves at the same level as God. The heir of the Shinarites, the people of Shinar, was immense pride. It was open rebellion against God, thinking that they were equal to or as superior as God himself is. Proverbs 16, verse 18, tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And so you see the pride here coming out before their destruction comes. John Piper has a great quote. He says, God's will for mankind is not that we find joy in being praised, but that we find joy in praising him. They had it all wrong. They wanted to receive the praise unto themselves. You know, oftentimes when 
speaking about pride in church, we confuse, we confuse it with ambition. So ambition goes out the window with pride. There's nothing wrong with being eager to do something good or even to do something great. The warning in this passage is that we need to check our motivation when we're seeking to do something good or when we're seeking to do something great. The error of the Shinarites was their motivation for their work. They wanted the other people to praise them. They wanted to exalt themselves and to make themselves greater than every other people on earth. There's a really interesting contrast here as we look ahead to next week's message in Genesis chapter 12. The interesting thing here is in Genesis 11, the desire of mankind, the desire of humanity was to make a name for themselves. But next week, we're gonna see as Pastor Tom preaches in in Genesis 12, that God's promise to Abraham was that God would make his name great. The challenge here is, In chapter 11 is motivation. Their motivation was to make themselves great. Then we see the the second error of the Shinarites. The second error in in point number two on your outline is that they wanted to seize control. Look again at verse five, and we'll see the Shinarites seeking control. It says, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Their fear that they were seeking to overcome through building this tower was a fear of being dispersed or scattered or spread out across the face of the earth. Now, it's very important that we look at the the flow of the story of Genesis, but we also look at running themes throughout the story of Genesis. And we've heard from the very beginning, since chapter one, that God's instruction to Adam and Eve and God's instruction to mankind was to fill the earth. God's instruction was to scatter and God's instruction was them for them to disperse across the whole earth. Remember in Genesis chapter one, verse 28, it says, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Filling the earth gives the idea of spreading out into going to every part of creation and stewarding all that God has made. And God repeated this same instruction to Noah after Noah left the ark and he was on the earth again. God told Noah in Genesis 9, verse 1, it said, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So spreading out, stewarding creation and having dominion over all things is for God's glory and it's his intention and it's God's plan from the very beginning. But here, the Shinarites are doing the exact opposite. They're gathering close together. They're trying to create one central location because lest we be dispersed, they didn't want to be scattered. They didn't want to spread out. They didn't want to do what God was telling them to do. They didn't spread out as God commanded. They took control and focused on building a centralized city where there was security and there was protection. The root issue for their refusal to spread out was a love of safety and a love of security. They seized control rather than trusting God to protect them. Building a tower and building a city actually exposed their heart before God. Building a city for them equaled a love of security. They wanted to avoid the risk of filling the earth and spreading out. Building a tower equaled a a love of praise. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Now, I don't want to confuse you or be misheard when I talk about a love for security, right? I don't want to cause any confusion. I'm not saying to go home and leave all your doors unlocked. I'm not saying to park your car, leave the windows down, leave your wallet on the driver's seat, leave your purse on the driver's seat. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we should live reckless lives. You know what? I'm standing here on the stage today. I'm very grateful that we have men in the room who are working security. So that way, if I say something foolish and people rush the stage to beat me up, I have a few guys who will pull them off me. I'm grateful for security. I'm grateful for police officers. I'm grateful for military. It, it's not saying live a reckless life, but here's what I want you to understand when I say a love of security. They were avoiding a risk that God was commanding them to make. And we have 
a love of security. We, we make security an idol when we refuse to obey God's commands because they're too hard or they're too difficult or we don't want to face the consequences of following God. That's what I mean when I talk about a love of security, when we make an idol out of security. God told humanity to fill the earth, to subdue it. That was his command. That was his instruction. Are there commands and instructions in God's words that you and I still refuse to obey today because they're too hard? You know, I don't want to go and seek forgiveness from that person or I don't want to go and give that person forgiveness because that relationship is too complicated. It's too hard. It's too confusing. You know, I don't, I don't want to go and love that person or, or serve that person because I just don't feel comfortable. You know, there, there's times where we actually choose our love of security, our love of comfort over that prompting that God has put in our hearts through his word as he's given us and his instructions and his commands. And a love of security is saying, no, God, I'm not gonna take any risk that takes me out of my secure bubble. I don't trust you enough to do what you've commanded. That's what I mean when I talk about a love of security. Even after the flood, the sinful con condition of humanity was unchanged. They still wanted to be in control and not trust God to be in control. The third error that we see here at the Tower of Babel is defining good and evil for themselves. They wanted to continue to define good and evil for themselves. This is the same thing that Adam and Eve did, right? They took the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to personally have their own knowledge of good and evil rather than trusting God and his definition of good and evil. We also see this in the people in the days of Noah. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They came up with their own definition of what was right. And here, the people at the Tower of Babel do the same thing. They decided for themselves what was best. They determined good and evil for themselves apart from God. They, think, they thought that they could rise up literally to the place of God, into the heavens, knowing good and evil for themselves. They wanted to be on an equal plane with God. And so we see God's response in verse five. The Lord came down to the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. There's two things in verse 5 that warn us that God is about to put them in their place. And it's actually, I think the author is using a little humor here. All right, bear with me here. Here's, here's the first thing that I find very interesting in verse five. God calls them children of man. He doesn't call them his children. He calls them children of man. Another translation is the sons of Adam. Let me explain this. Dads, have you ever come home from work and it looked like the kids were in trouble and your wife referred to them as your children? or your sons? Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever done that to your spouse? Where, where, you know, they come to the room and they say, look what your kid did. Look what your children have done. That's, that's actually a cue. It's a very important cue. That's a cue to the spouse who just walked in the room that you better bring the discipline, that right now I need you to step up right now and put these kids in their place. And that's a warning to the children, you're busted. And I believe that there's a warning here from the author telling the, the people at the Tower of Babel, you're busted, you children of man. <laughs> this is not what children of God do. God is communicating that they're in trouble and that discipline is coming. The building of the city and the tower are similar to what Adam did when he rebelled against God and he ate the fruit and wanted to know for himself his own definition of knowledge of good and evil. The sinful nature of Adam passed on to his descendants 
including you and me today. Now, the second thing, we see some irony here. And there's some clear irony where it says that the Lord came down. Those words came down are very ironic that God came down to see the city and the tower. This is holy scorn here. The author is mocking the tower that was built up to the heavens where God sits because in order for God to see it, he literally had to come down to see it. He's mocking their attempts to place themselves anywhere near God's level or God's authority. The tower is so far from reaching heaven that God had to come down to see it. God can see everything, right? He's omnipresent. He's at all places at all times. God can see you and I right now. He doesn't have to come down. But the author is mocking the tower and mocking their attempts to even put themselves at the same level of God because he's reminding them that's not even possible. It's not even possible to put yourself on the same level as an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God. The author wants to show the ludicrous nature of man's God-belittling pride in his little achievement. And so he's taking a, a, a risk here by using some irony to describe God looking down at this supposed great tower with its supposed tops in the heavens. Now, these two clues lead us to the result of the building of the Tower of Babel. The result was tragedy and discipline. Pride goes before destruction. Discipline is coming here. Notice what God says in verse 6. Behold, there are one people, and they all have one language. That signals that God not, was not only about to divide their language, but in doing so, he was divide them one people against the other. And he's about to multiply their languages and multiply the people groups. It says in verse 7, Come, let us go down there and and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. It's interesting here that through disciplining humanity, God still accomplished his purpose. What was the discipline? He scattered them. What was God's instruction going back to Genesis 1 and again after the flood of Noah? Was that they would fill the earth, that they would scatter, and because they refused to do that on their own, God did it for them. He scattered all the people groups. God's purpose of filling the earth was accomplished despite the disobedience of mankind. And I think that's important for us to understand. A lot of times we ask ourselves, why does God allow bad things to happen? Well, friends, God is still accomplishing his purpose in spite of the evil in the world. God still accomplishes his purpose despite bad things that may happen to you and I. That does not mean that God takes joy or that God takes delight in evil, but his purpose can't be thwarted. His purpose can't be stopped. God's response to the pride and arrogance of man was to make it harder for man to communicate and unite in self-exalting and God-belittling ways. And God has built in the world system by which when, when people rise up according to their pride, their pride restrains themselves one against the other because as one people group gets proud and tries to elevate themselves against the other, other people groups will rise up to stop them. God knows the immense potential of human beings created in his own image. And he has given us an amazing liberty to exalt ourselves and to design our own security systems without trusting him. But there are limits. The thousands of languages around the world and thousands of different people groups with their global aspirations limit each other as people oppose people here on earth. Now we need to keep this in mind. When God permits something to happen, he does so for a reason, and God still has a plan. Despite what happens here in Babel, his plan will still be accomplished. And so let's look at God's plans in comparison to our own plans, in comparison to humanity's plans. Even though God permitted the spectacular sin of pride and rebellion to take place at Shinar, he knows exactly what his will is, and he knows exactly what he wants to accomplish. This means that The people, groups, and languages of the world are not an afterthought. They're not an accident. God didn't confuse everything and say, oh no, what will I do now? They're a judgment on sin, but still they're a part of God's plan. 
And at the same time, even though they're judgment on sin, they're for his glory. Because every people group, every tribe and tongue and language will one day worship God. And so God's plan ultimately, first of all, point one on your outline, is to exalt himself. His plan is to exalt himself. He's God. He is creator and ruler over all things. It's, it's not pride that causes him to want to exalt himself. It's, it's glory. He is worthy of praise. He deserves it. As creator, God is Lord over all and worthy to be praised. And we could join God in exalting his name. And one way that we could join God in bringing praise to his name is doing great things. We should do great things. I, I said earlier that ambition should not be thrown out the window with pride. And one way that we could exalt God and bring glory to him is by doing great things here on earth and giving him praise. As believers, we should build great schools. We should build great businesses. We should build great hospitals. As believers, we should provide excellent customer ex experience. We should provide excellent professional help. We should provide excellent quality service. As believers, we should do our best in all of our work. Everything that we put our mind and our hands to, we should do our best. The simple challenge is that we need to continually fight against our own prize, our, our own pride to do it for our own praise. We need to battle against that continually. And humility begins with trust and obedience. When we trust and obey God's commands and we place ourselves under his authority, it's then natural for him to receive credit and for him to receive glory because whatever great thing we did, we did it under his authority and we did it for him and through the power that he's given us. That leads us to the second point of God's plan. The second point is that we submit to his control. Not that we seize control for ourselves as they did in Shinar, but that we submit to his control. Proverbs 10, 24 says, what the wicked dreads will come upon him but the desire of the righteous will be granted. That's a great promise there, that the desire of the righteous will be granted. Is there a desire on your heart? Is it your, would you like for God to fulfill that desire? Well, well, here's how. When we submit to God, we're actually not giving up our own desires. When we truly submit to God, what we're doing is we are aligning our desires with his desires. We're coming in line with him. And when we do this, God's response is to give us the desire of our hearts. Psalms 37 says it another way. Psalm 37, 3 and 4, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Again, a promise from God to give us the desire of our heart. How do we receive the desire of our heart? Is to align our desires with his desires. When we align our will to God's will, God's desire becomes our desire. You see this all the time. You can see this in sports. When, when a, a team is all about individual ego, they get divided, they don't win the championship. But when a team can come together and they can all have one desire, everyone sets aside their ego, sets aside their pride, and they all work together, you see them winning the championship. You see this in marriages when two people come together and instead of fighting against what he wants and what she wants, it's what they want together and they begin moving in the same path and they begin winning at marriage. When we align our desires desires with others we make progress and what God is saying is that when we align our desires with his desire he will give us the desire of his heart because God's going to accomplish his will so when I'm aligned with God's will when God's will becomes my will I will receive the desire of my heart it's aligning with God such a contrast to the people at Shinar because the first half of the passage, verses three and four, completely revealed that they wanted their own desire. They wanted to make their own great. And God ultimately judged them because he couldn't allow them to have the desire of their heart because they did not align with his plan. Now the third thing that God desires from us for God's plan is that we hold to his definition of good and evil. 
that we hold to his definition of good and evil. Up until this point, the pattern for humanity was to seek their own definition of good and evil. Adam and Eve sought their own definition of good and evil. The people in the days of Noah did what was right in their own eyes. They had their own definition of good and evil. And the same happened here at the Tower of Babel, and it still happens in our world today. And I think one of the great things that we need to be careful of in our world today is becoming enamored with a particular personality. It's so easy for us in this day of, of, of entertainment and, and YouTube and social media and news that we find one person who speaks and we consume everything that they say and we just begin to follow everything that they proclaim. You could do this with a pastor or a preacher. You could do this with, with just a, a personality. You could do this with a newscaster. And it's really interesting. We get in the habit of listening to the same person's voice every day, listening to them over and over, but that is one way that we can actually be led astray. Instead of aligning ourselves just with one famous personality, one thing that we need to work on doing is aligning ourselves and taking every issue to God and his word and seeking to find out what God's definition of good and evil is on that particular topic or that particular subject. C.S. Lewis has a really interesting quote. He says, a man does not call a line crooked, unless he has some idea of a straight line. God's word provides us with a straight line. God's word provides us with a clear definition of good and evil. And it's so easy when we come up with a very hard topic, whether it's a social topic or a political topic or a business topic, it's so easy for us to run immediately to our favorite source of information our favorite personality that gives us their commentary or their analysis or their opinion. But friends, every human is fallible. Every human is a son of Adam. There's a crookedness in each of our hearts and God's word is the only true and trusted straight line that we can take every issue to. And so we need to keep God's word as the standard for good and evil and not be swept away by different personalities or platforms and follow their agendas as well. And the result of doing these three things, the, the result of submitting to God's control, the result of holding to God's definition of good and evil, the, the result of exalting God's name above our own name is blessing. God's ultimate desire is to bless us, to give us the desire of our heart. What's amazing about the story is that God can use human disobedience to accomplish his purpose. As we trace the Bible narrative from creation to the fall and now through man's failures throughout the the Old Testament where man continually failed on his own to redeem himself, we still have hope because God's purpose prevailed despite the failures that we see throughout the Old Testament. In spite of the confusion at the Tower of Babel, Jesus still had all authority to redeem the world. Jesus still had the power within him to make things right. Even though though that now the people were scattered, even though they were now many languages, even though they were now many people groups, Jesus still had all authority to make this right. I love the promise in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus still has all authority to make things right despite man's continual errors, man's continual folly, man's continual disobedience. So he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. You know, what's so amazing about the story of of the Tower of Babel is that here we see discipline leading to a confusion of all the languages and all the people put at odds against each other and we see the rise of people against people and nation against nation and, and this group against that group. But the promise at the end of the book when you get to Revelation, is that all these people, all these different tribes and tongues and languages, all all these people will gather as one voice in unity and worship God for eternity. Disobedience led to the people being scattered. It led to the people being confused in their languages. But Jesus can ultimately have the power to bring it all together underneath God's headship so that God receives the glory. You know, every time we look at the story of the Tower of Babel, we should pause and ask ourselves three questions. 
Three questions, and I want to leave you with these three. First is, am I exalting myself? Am I exalting myself or am I exalting God? God wants me to do great things, but what's my motivation? Is my motivation so that people praise me or is my motivation so that God is praised? Question number two, am I taking control? Am I taking control or am I submitting to his control? Am I taking control or am I submitting to his control? Is there a risk that I'm unwilling to make because I I lack faith in him? Or have I aligned myself completely under his authority? And third question is, am I seizing autonomy? Or am I living according to his definition of good and evil? Am I seizing autonomy or am I living according to his definition of good and evil? Friends, all around us, there is a battle going on for a definition of good and evil. It's fought everywhere you look in public discourse, whether it's on the news or social media. And it's easy to get swept up in it. It's easy to get irate about it. But what we have to be is a group of people who continually goes back to God's word and trusts his definition of good and evil and chooses to follow him. Let's pray to that end. God, I just thank you that you have the power to make all things right. God, as we look at the world around us, it's easy to lose heart as we see evil prevail and people rise against people and tragedy after tragedy. But God, your purpose will not be thwarted. Your son has all power to save us and redeem the world. And so God, today here, we simply say that we submit ourselves to you, God. We trust you. May we be people who faithfully choose to obey you and follow you in all things. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Let's declare it together. Sing, all the earth will shout your praise. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, Great are you, Lord. Come on, one last time. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, like to uh, pray with someone after the service we've got a prayer team up here and uh, remember to pray for those uh, students this Tuesday night as they share the gospel at youth group uh, God bless you guys and have a great week we'll see you next Sunday <laughs>